This um, conference has two purposes. One for the practitioners to talk to us, and the other for us to talk to the practitioners. Now you notice that we're failing on that second front. Um, the practitioner have all left, I think. I'm looking for an exception to that rule, so I guess this is too bad. Um, nevertheless, we have a great panel that I think will catch us up on the state of research in three areas, accounting, finance and uh, law. Uh, my job is to introduce Dan Armoran, who has not only been very influential on this panel, he's done an incredible amount of work to pull this panel together and will continue to do a lot of work for this panel because the review which these people have gotten together will be more than likely published in RAST as a review article. So their work's not entirely in vain, it will actually be published and there'll be more than just this audience to see this. But Dan has also contributed a lot in helping us find panellists for the other sessions, so thanks a lot Dan. Uh, Dan, as you all know, I don't think Dan's a stranger to any of you, is an uh, up-and-coming, successful assistant professor at Columbia University, very well known. Can I so, point fraud this year? <laughs> Can I point fraud this year? It's not true. Well, that's my opinion anyway. Um, so I'll hand it over to uh, Dan to, to take over at this point. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Peter, for, for inviting me to organize that, this session. Um, so, I mean, I'm fortunate enough because I didn't really do the work to organize the session. The guy, the guy that did most of the work is Zan Bozanich from Ohio State. Uh, he couldn't be here for personal reason, but really the one who did the heavy lifting here is uh, Zan. Uh, Zan is an expert on, on fraud research. His uh, fraud-related research has been published and then featured in the media, including the Wall Street Journal, and uh, put into practice by both financial institutions and data vendors such as Audit Analytics and Bloomberg. So for, for, mom, for most part, I won't read like the long bios of everyone. You can read them in that booklet that you received from the conference, so I'll make it, I'll make it short. But let me, let me just talk to you about the task that Peter, uh, Peter gave me when, when he sent me the, the first email. He said, well, what I want you to do is to design and organize a session on overview of recent academic research. And the email had like weird sentences, like you can cast a wide net if you would like and I will give you free reign. So now people who know me and Peter does know me, that's usually a huge mistake. <laughs> you, know, you give me an opportunity to go and do whatever I want, that usually doesn't end, uh, doesn't end well. And again, we're fortunate to Zan uh, to help me uh, put some structure behind the things that we wanted to do. So after receiving this email, we did some brainstorming and we started with an observation. And the observation that we had is fraud and fraud research is by construction an interdisciplinary field. So you think, for example, about the fraudulent, they think about their economic agents that have behavioral biases, behavioral biases or behavioral, some sort of socio sociological and psychological behavior. They work in a legal environment and they're manipulating accounting data. So we have this multidisciplinary problem and the people who do research in this area rarely speak to each other. So we use different languages, we have different definitions, different methods, and we ask different questions. And I thank Peter for organizing the conference, this conference because this enabled us actually to, to speak to each other. So what we're going to try to do in this panel today and in the paper that we're going to write is we're going to try to break some of those silos. Uh, so we wanted to gather some of the top experts in the field in law, uh, uh, finance, and accounting, and essentially give them a guideline. So we didn't, we didn't want to give them complete structure of what to do. We thought that's part of the discretion of an expert. But at least they will need to teach us and teach each other uh, uh, what are the research questions in their discipline, why they're important, what are the problems, and then try to help us connect the dots. Uh, to figure out uh, uh, to figure out how we can we can learn and move forward again then try to write something about that so the panelists I, I'm, I'm fortunate I don't 
really need to introduce them, but I'll give a few words about e each one of them. So the first one, uh, which is the finance and economics uh, expert in this panel, is John Karpov. Uh, so John is the Washington Mutual Endowed Chair in Innovation and Professor of Finance at the University of Washington. That's a mouthful. Um, John is a thought, le thought leader in, in the economic causes and consequences of financial mis misconduct. And for some odd reason, he likes to climb on mountains, but that's just, I don't understand why. Um, our law expert is, is Jim Cox. Uh, Jim is the Bernard Corey Professor of Law at Duke University. Uh, in addition to publish numerous papers, Jim also published several books, one of them with a very fascinating title, Financial Information, Accounting, and the Law. And this should be a required reading for us. Jim testified before the U.S. House and Senate and is a member of many advisory boards, including the PCOB. Uh, what you probably don't know about Jim is that his wife, Ellen, was Steve Spenman's PhD student when, uh, when she was in Berkeley. So he's pretty well entrenched in, in the accounting profession in addition to being a law professor. Um, the last expert is Richard Sloan in accounting. Um, Richard, I, and I have very high sensitivity to at least say the name of the chair, Emil, Emilia chair, is that the correct? <laughs> okay, so I, I tried my best. Uh, chair in accounting and international business in Berkeley. Richard actually knows a thing or two about practice. He was the managing director of equity research at Berkeley's Global Investor, one of the more prolific authors in accounting, won uh, awards for teaching and re research, including the AA notable and significant contribution uh, to the literature. So what we're going to do now is we're going to give uninterrupted 15 minutes overview uh, of the literature and the issues that we discussed to each of the panelists. And essentially, right then, after, after they finished, we're going to go to q and I'm not going to ask any questions. I will let you ask the questions and, and see how, how, how it goes from there. OK? Thank you. So John. Thank you, Dan. Um, Oops, we're to the Q&A part. Oh. <laughs> that was a good talk. Don't. <laughs> My best ever. Don't let the finance professor changing the, change the slides. Yes. So, you know, I do have a, a story to tell. I really want to uh, thank Dan Zahn for the invitation to be, be here and to Peter and Craig for organizing the conference. I've been sitting up in the nosebleed section and just consuming like crazy. The number of times where I will say something like, oh, I didn't know that, is like now countless. Uh, and it started even before the conference started. I caught a ride with Zovana in from the airport, and, and uh, your name came up, Craig. So she said, so what do you think about RoboCop? And I said, oh, I didn't know about that. <laughs> and then Craig introduces me the night, the reception that very night to uh, David Woodcock, and, and uh, don't let him introduce you to people because he introduces me as an expert in fraud. <laughs> David Woodcock immediately goes, ah, so what do you think about the fraud triangle? I said, what's that? <laughs> it's been happening ever since. So th having thus established my credentials, um, <laughs> Uh, there are a couple of things I, I would like to say. I think I, there are three things that I, that I at least have an opinion about that I'd like to convey to you. And uh, this is my way of trying to uh, put some shell or structure around the task, which is to, excuse me, talk about the literature. So rather than just talk about the literature, I'll try to talk about three things around this topic. Why is financial misconduct such a big thing? I uh, didn't put on a slide, but I have data on the number of articles published in finance journals uh, related to financial misconduct, and it's an upward trend. Here's reason number one. It's simply fun. Everybody likes a good crime story, and I think there's also a direct and obvious connection between what we do as researchers and policy implications. So that's my first thing I want to convey to you. How am I doing? <laughs> number two is uh, that there are a lot of data available. And I'm list I've listed here four common uh, uh, databases that are used in which proxies are selected to identify samples of things that variously are uh, considered restatements or aggressive accounting or 
uh, financial misconduct or sometimes fraud. And the reason I've listed these particular four common uh, uh, databases, before I go any farther or further, I should say, uh, can I ask for a show of hands, of, who has used one or more of these databases? Thank you, okay. Um, well, the reason I, I listed these four is that it gives me a, an opportunity to flog this working paper I have with Allison Kester, Scott Lee, and, and Jerry Martin, who's here. And one thing I'd like to do is talk about, uh, just give you a, a glimpse of some of the things that we think we've been discovering about how all of us, or at least I and I think many other researchers, have um, uh, been using these data and some suggestions on how we might be able to look at them and use them better. And so to motivate this, I have a couple of very simple tests, I hope these numbers are not too small, in which we do very simple pre-post comparisons with several different outcome variables using the events as identified in each of these four databases to capture a sample of something that a researcher might be interested in, such as uh, something that we su suspect is correlated with misconduct, let's say. And in my very first one, we have working capital accruals as our outcome variable. We're simply looking at before to after the revelation, the year before to the year of the revelation of this misconduct as identified by this data source. And you can see that uh, there are some stories that working capital accruals will be relatively high before the revelation of misconduct and low subsequently. And if you have that story, you'll find support for that story in uh, data using the GO restatements or using the securities class action clearinghouse from Stanford. But if you use either of the other two databases, you won't find significant results. Um, if you look at some other outcome variables, say new equity issues, a windows of opportunity hypothesis suggests that new equity issues would be relatively high before and low after. And you find support for that using two of the databases, but not significant support using the other two. Or similarly, windows of opportunity hypotheses have been used to motivate tests of share repurchases. Whoops, I'm going the wrong way. Um, and here you find uh, support for that where share repurchases would be relatively high subsequently using uh, the uh, uh, database from House that, that Patty and co-authors have put together and not using, the, in fact, you get a negative sign using the audit analytics database. So we found this for a large number of, of outcome variables in very simple tests. And in fact, in one metric uh, that we put together, if you redo these various tests, just plugging in events and dates from one database or another, you can replicate the outcome from one study, one randomly supported, randomly selected source by choosing another randomly selected source. You, you, you replicate at a rate of 39% which is a very low replication rate. Here's another example. Uh, I put these slides in at the last minute, just, you know, we have a lot of, several examples of this, but since um, this uh, uh, question, this paper came up by Luigi, who left, unfortunately, uh, although he has seen these slides before, or these numbers, not these slides. Um, this is uh, Alexander Dick, Adair Morse, and Luigi have, the, have this working paper trying to identify using, uh, Arthur Anderson's demise, uh, a procedure, a very clever procedure by which you can get some measure of the uh, fraction of firms that are committing fraud that are not getting caught. And the key to their, what they do is they use Bayes' rule and they use this identification strategy to come up with a measure of the probability detection, which in their baseline model is 26.7%. And they use that in Bayes' rule to come up with an unconditional probability of fraud occurring of 15% in any given firm year. Um, and they use other measures to come up with an a measure of the average cost of fraud on an annual basis. Uh, if you go, these are very important, again, a clever and study with a neat identification strategy with important outcomes. But it turns out that the outcome depends on the input. What if we simply plug in as our proxy for misconduct not the Stanford class action lawsuits, but rather the uh, CFRM uh, AAERs. You get very different numbers using the same procedure, same criteria. Appealing to other databases, you also get a wide range of different results. 
So for example, whereas DGLS, sorry, not here, over here, DGLS here, gets a um, uh, $49 billion cost on an annual basis, that's much lower than what Dick, uh, Morrison's, and Gallus get in their measure. So you're getting really different results, in other words, from choosing samples from e any of these very popular databases. And we tried to figure out what's going on, and part of the reason is simply that these uh, data sources are giving us different collections of events. These numbers are a little bit outdated. The Venn diagram is not to scale, but Basically, the idea is that there isn't a lot of overlap. We're not, these different databases are not simply sampling different subsets from the same underlying pool, it appears. Or if they are, the subsets are a very different characteristic. More fundamentally, I think, is what's illustrated in this very turgid slide. So I apologize for all the little writing and lots of lines, but let me try to unpack it. This is what I think is, uh, the, if I had to point to a single thing that I think is most important that I've learned from trying to look at and understand the different empirical results on the previous slides, it's summarized in this slide. This is a timeline of important informational disclosures related to computer associates fraud. And uh, uh, it was, um, uh, you can see there are a lot of these different little lines on this thing. Uh, they're summarized down here. We identify 41 informational events. Now, of course, there are hundreds of informational events, hundreds of, of, of simple filings related to class action lawsuit. But we pick, uh, using what we think is somewhat a reasoned judgment, what we think are key events that convey new information about the nature of the misconduct and the consequences to individuals or the firm from the misconduct. And you can see in total there are four press announcements, eight earnings restatements, there's a class action filing, so that initial class action filing, there were a bunch of lawsuits that were all consolidated. Uh, one uh, uh, initial uh, announcement of a settlement and 27 regulatory actions. That is where the SEC filed a litigation release or an administ administrative proceeding. Um, the AARs are secondary designation for some but not all of these uh, 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 regulatory filings, and in this case, there are 12 of the 27 received a secondary AER designation. So what happens if you draw a sample, even for an event that does, in fact, appear in all four of these databases? What, if, what happens if you draw a sample, uh, say, from the GAO restatement database? Well, you're going to get, it turns out the GAO has seven of the eight restatements related to uh, computer associates misconduct, and it also has an eighth restatement during the same time period that is unrelated to this particular misconduct. So it has eight restatements. You'll get, you'll get a slice of the information about the full sequence. You're getting, you'll get several stills out of a long video, in other words. Or what happens if you draw a sample from the Audit Analytics database? Audit Analytics has many more um, events in its, in its uh, universe, but in this particular case, and in fact in many cases, it doesn't have as many of the restatement announcements as uh, the GAO. And you'll get a sliver of the information, or how about the security class action clearinghouse, you'll get information on a lawsuit, or if you access AERs, you'll get the sequence of regulatory actions that got an AER designation. But in each one of these cases, you're, you're only going to be getting a part of the picture. And I think that's the fundamental learning. Uh, in our paper, we go through what several implications of this general um, uh, uh, approach, uh, uh, the consequences of this general approach. I want to harken back to just yesterday, uh, Zovana uh, said something about how it's important to take a holistic approach. I just found myself nodding because that's what I think I've learned about this, that it's important to try to get out of the, the blinders from one particular proxy that we use to identify misconduct events. Um, I said there are three things that I learned uh, that I'd like to convey, and the third thing is why we do this research is that it's important. So to try to talk about why it's important, uh, 
I'm going to appeal to Dilbert here, and I'll read through this cartoon strip at the, at the risk of you being ahead of me already. If we lease a machine from you, how can we be sure you'll stay in business to service it? How can we be sure you'll have money to pay the, the lease? You could check our financials. I'm pretty sure your financials are as fraudulent as ours. <laughs> Good point, says Dilbert. I think that's my favorite line in the whole thing. It's just like taken as gra for granted. Maybe we could ask trusted third parties to vouch for us. Do you trust any third parties? Not since my financial advisor put my retirement savings in a Ponzi scheme and had an affair with my wife <laughs> and thus ended capitalism. I like this strip because what Scott Adams has done is he's summarized in a really cool way Ackerloss lemons problem. And when you think about it, the lemons problem characterizes a fundamental issue in all transactions, in all exchange and production activity. And what it, what it captures is the importance of the leap of trust that has to happen between two parties to make a transaction. Economists have known this since the days of Adam Smith. Adam Smith wrote, you know, his first big book was A Theory of Moral Sentiments, which, which was primarily about how it is that we as disparate, self-interested people um, form community in a way that provides for and enables collaborative effort. And then he formalized some of these ideas with the wealth of nations. Um, economists have spent a lot of time since then building theoretical models about how tr in which trust is important. Uh, but I want to simply point out that this leap of trust really is at the core of exchange and production activity. You know, when I do something as simple as go to the store to buy an apple, that's a huge leap of trust that not only will I get a decent apple, but I won't get ptomaine poisoning. Um, and you know, especially since the supply chain involves a bunch of people who I don't know. What is it that enables, facilitates that building of trust? That's a core economic question. And I think the reason that fraud research is so compelling is it provides an unusual opportunity to get insight into the role of trust. The reason for this is that it's very difficult to measure this nebulous thing called trust. But instead, what we can do is we measure the deltas that happen when there is a breakdown in trust. And that gives us some insight into where trust plays a role, how trust is built, um, and uh, what happens when it's destroyed. Uh, to the extent that I have time, and Dan, please tell me if I, if I don't, I have a couple of slides that are my attempt to actually now summarize a little bit of the research. Am I out yeah, of time? You, or? you can take a few minutes. Okay. Um, so I thought I'd make up a schematic. So I have a triangle, since I have three things I'd like to talk about in the leap of trust, and I think one thing that, uh, one area of research is about laws, institutions, regulations, regulators. A lot of the stuff we've talked about here, a lot of the research ideas that come out of this set of discussions would fall in this leg of the triangle. In the finance literature, a bunch of this comes under the category of law and finance. I, I'm going to advocate that the term law and finance should not simply apply to LLSV type research, but rather the broad scope of the role of the legal process in helping facilitate and build trust. Second area is the role of personal ethics and culture. This is the focus of all our, our ethics courses that Luigi last night told us that should not be taught, but that we should be incorporating into our classes. Uh, and then the third area, and the area in which uh, I've been personally most involved, is in the role of market forces and reputational capital. Um, this is a, an idea that I think is obvious once pointed out, but I think I, I'm amazed by how frequently it is forgotten in both the policy and the scholarly uh, debates on these issues. And to illustrate what I mean by reputational loss, I don't mean something fuzzy. I mean the loss of a capital asset, which is a present value of future cash flows that accrue from holding up your end of the deal. To illustrate, uh, here's a, a sequence of uh, one-day cumulative abnormal returns for Xerox during a 10-year period that ended about 10 years ago. And uh, I'll, I'll show you why I picked this. What happened was at the beginning of this period for almost three years, Xerox was involved in a uh, uh, sort of uh, 
booking the revenues aggressively scheme in which it was booking revenues, the full sequence of lease payments that it was contracting for when at least it's copying machines. And it, this allowed it to uh, report fairly good earnings. It enjoyed good stock price performance until almost three years after it started the scheme, it realized it couldn't continue to grow out of this problem. It was going to have to recognize the problem. And it announced that earnings uh, would be short of projections. The stock price fell. And this triggered a sequence of things that included an SEC investigation, Wells notices going out, a sequence of regulatory actions, people paying fines, company paying fines, people being dis disbarred, until 10 years later the, the, the enforcement action concluded. On this slide, I've taken the price pattern from the previous slide and I've made it in a stylized form. And, and the green line is a stylized representation of the price path over time. And the red line is a representation of where we think this thing might have been had the firm not committed fraud to begin with. So you can see that uh, the, the firm enjoyed a price increase in, far, in part facilitated by its aggressive um, uh, uh, booking of revenues and then it suffered a big price decrease when its misconduct was uncovered. And uh, what we observe in this case is it lost $5 billion of market cap and using procedures I won't describe here, uh, uh, one way of, of measuring things is that about 23% of this represented just a decrease back to the value it would have otherwise have. Another 10% is due to the total legal penalties, classic lawsuit, SEC penalties imposed on the firm. And the remaining, the remaining is uh, what I want to use to illustrate as a loss in reputation capital. Um, in this case, is about two-thirds. And I picked this example because this is what we're finding in large, uh, large sample studies as well. Uh, so again, what happens to this firm is it doesn't simply go back to the red line. It loses something else that's valuable to it. In this case, what we see is, um, I'm going to skip this. What we see is that these market value drops are capitalizations or pricing of the sequence of events that we see happening to these firms. We see these firms having higher cost of capital, lower future sales, higher internal disruption in the cost that come with that. That's what I mean by reputation loss. And this thing over here is simply a measure that we can uh, compute using market price reactions. You're looking at me. Yes. Okay. <laughs> So let me stop there. I was going to spend a couple of times talking about whether we might be able to begin pushing a little bit on this third leg of the triangle that I think is ready for an explosion of research, and that is uh, the role of culture. And my takeaway, which I won't go through here, is, um, is that I think one reason that we're going to see a lot of extra work or new work in this area, that's pretty exciting, is because we're getting more and more measures. Of, of uh, that, that pick, pick up things such as culture. And these measures are things like religion, geography, uh, like Chris's recent paper on, on this in networks. And because of this explosion of measures, I think we're going to have increased insights about the role of culture as well as the role of legal institutions and market forces in encouraging trust. Thank you. just reminds me never to do a deal with a finance professor. Never, it's never a few minutes. <laughs> so I'm a, a Jim Cox and I'm from the Planet Law School. And the reason I say that is that we come from a very different culture. Uh, I'm gonna start off talking about my presentation a little bit about we are academics and the Legal Academy uh, come from and what shapes their thinking, and that can explain a lot about their uh, the realm in which they they operate. Uh, perhaps the best way to say that is that we're distinctive in the academy. Uh, the students edit the journals, and we grade the papers. Okay, and so it, it is it is a, a, a very different world. Uh, the education is uh, and classic education ingrains one and and and. Uh, 
doctrine and process, okay? Uh, you've probably noticed this when you've served on university committees with them. The lawyers on the committee are always thinking about, well, how are we going to do this? What kind of notice we're going to have? All the process. And everybody else wants to jump into what's the quest answer, what are the right questions, but the lawyers are going to think about how you're going to go about thinking about this process. And that's a lot about our education, largely in the first year, which is this case method that goes back over 100 years that uh, Langdell introduced at, 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 at Harvard. Uh, to the extent that there's quantitative uh, education going on uh, in, in the classrooms of the law schools, uh, it's largely remedial. I mean, I speak from that as being uh, an accountant and statistic major in college, a double majors, okay, uh, along the way. So I felt, and I passed the CPA exam when I was still in college and worked for a big eight firm uh, before going to law school and worked while I was in law school for a big eight firm. Uh, so I was really bemused, to say the least, about what the backgrounds were, which was non-existent and still is today for most people who come to law school. So law schools don't have a heavy uh, orientation. Uh, I will say that that has changed. I mean, some of the great contributions to legal education came not from Harvard, uh, but came from Chicago, Henry Manny, uh, and that is the law and economics movement. But the early law and economics movement was pretty basic economics 101, uh, learning a little bit about supply and demand curves, thinking about what the incentives are, but it was not very quantitative. The early law and economics folks would tell you, well, this is an empirical question, but uh, even if you were uh, Richard Posner or Frank Easterbrook or Danny Fischel, some of the early ones, uh, they didn't dirty themselves at that point with trying to get, uh, that's it. So we started finding out that law schools suddenly thought that, well, enough of this theory, let's go out and start hiring or finding people who have some quantitative skills. And uh, this has been a change. So if you looked at legal education in 1988, 5% of the tenure, tenure track people had a PhD, okay? Uh, if you look at the hiring, the entry-level hiring uh, that went on from 2011 to 2015, nationwide in the uh, number of accredited law schools, that you'd find that the, uh, there was 21%. But if you go up to feeding change, that is the so-called elite law schools, the top 26, the hiring was 48% were PhDs, one, roughly one out of two. So suddenly the academy, the legal academy, is becoming more and more uh, uh, by degrees, okay? JD, PhDs, many times in our faculty, just PhDs. Uh, those numbers are a little bit inflated because uh, most of those PhDs don't look like you, okay? That 70% are in political science or history, only 30% are in economics or in what I would think would be the, the hard mathematics, okay? And, uh, but what you find is the currency in the realm, certainly in the last dozen years in legal education, has shifted. And it's shifted so that if you're going to have a good piece, you've got to be a very good theoretician. There are very few of those, by the way. Uh, or you've got to have an empirical hook. And so you find individuals uh, teching up. Okay? You find individuals associating themselves with technical skills or you find the, the PhDs coming in. So the realm, the realm is changing in that regard. Nonetheless, I, uh, the piece we'll be having is to say that there is good, substantial Katz's work. I should have had listed here. He was here yesterday. Uh, uh, but there is good, substantial work and theory uh, that, that goes on. I had just a few of the pieces here. But there, there are different kinds of places. One, like the Galati piece, is looking at how fraud gets impacted by all kinds of behavioral devices, such as hindsight bias, okay? Uh, and uh, uh, whereas when you look at the Goldberg piece, what they're doing is what I would think was a more technical legal kind of analysis, and that is that federal courts looking at what fraud is are really distorting what fraud is because they're not understanding what actually is the common law roots of which fraud is. So that's the high theory stuff. Uh, the work that we go on and talk about, well, one bucket of uh, empirical work is taking a hard look at the efficacy of enforcement. Enforcement occurs um, out of a government regulation, but most of the enforcement occurs in fraud, and certainly in my area, securities and financial fraud, in a, a private litigation, okay? So the first one I'm looking at is private I think the best piece uh, I've seen come out 
I actually have some bias because I actually recruited J.B. Heaton and Lon Broad to write this piece for some that symposium I put together. But I think it's just an excellent piece in explaining how the legal system is so blind to the, the difficulties of applying a CAPM or any kind of event study in a one-off situation. And uh, Alon and JB discuss the problem of the lack of statistical power uh, in the models that are used there. And these models are everything. I mean, the reason that you see a vast decline, you maybe had some discussion about this, I'm sorry I've been traveling around, but I wasn't here yesterday, but when the Cornerstone folks, they all capture very nicely that the securities class action, while it's not going the route of the dinosaur and falling off the cliff totally, it is a substantial decline. The reason for that is either, like anything else in basic economics 101, you raise the price, you're gonna have a lot less consumption. It's extraordinarily expensive to bring these cases today because you need to have the forensic economists involved both on the prosecution side, okay, to be able to make sure you got your event study there and you got something there and you're gonna spend a lot of money on those event studies. Uh, there's other costs that go into it as well. You gotta not only event study to indicate when the lie was told, what the market reaction is, but you gotta uh, damn well make out the case that when the truth came out, the stock went down, okay? And that's a very tricky poss possibility. Again, going back to the uh, problems that we see in the broad Heaton study. Uh, uh, the, other point to point out here is uh, an empirical efficacy system. You know, the system is not going to work very well in the public's eye if we don't think the money goes into the pockets of people who are injured. If it just goes into the transaction cost of litigating these things, the lawyers make out like bandits, then it leaves a lot to be. So we have something here called the Cox-Thomas discount. That when at a point where the plaintiff's bar thought I was a good guy, I got him to lean on the various claims administrators so we could go in and take a look and say who's showing up and get paid and what's happening. And what we found here uh, in the study that's listed here is that 72%, 72% of the financial institutions that we could identify that had claims by looking at the 13F forms, okay, uh, that identify had claims did not show up. Did not show up. Uh, to reclaim any money. This is not to say they had to file an action. They had to fill out a form and send it in and they'd get some money, okay? A lot of money. So that's why you see a letting billions slip through their fingers. Another paper we wrote was so, uh, uh, leaving money on the table. Uh, the Baker Perino piece is another illustration about the efficacy. I mean, how do you pay the lawyers? And well, the thing is you start off, who pay, selects the lawyer? Somebody called the lead plaintiff. And the lead plaintiff is somebody uh, who gets appointed by the court because they have a presumption that they're the most adequate plaintiff that they have the largest financial loss. And, uh, but what the Baker uh, study shows is that courts pay attention to the fee arrangement that the lead plaintiff has with the lawyer in only about 11% of the time. Now, I would think that a good indication about whether you have an adequate plaintiff is whether the plaintiff's gonna be an adequate representative of the class and they're gonna negotiate up front with the right set of incentives, right? And that's something you learn in economics. Right set of incentives to make sure the plaintiff is gonna, plaintiff's lawyer is gonna represent the class and what's happening. Uh, the, you know, the Baker Perino study is disquieting about that. Uh, we have more studies here to try to, to point out the fact that, well, when you have financial institutions that are the lead plaintiff, that's both the Choi Cox and the, uh, the Cox papers here, the first couple of them like that, when you have financial institutions uh, showing up and representing that, you find that there's much larger recoveries, not only in absolute terms, but in terms of provable losses, et cetera. Well, that sounds pretty darn good. Maybe this lead plaintiff worked out pretty well. We want to get the financial institutions there. Hey, how do we know they're not cherry picking the cases? Okay? You know, so one of the empirical problems we have here is, I'm gonna keep going on, talking about the things we don't know. And we know they cherry pick the cases. I'm gonna to talk to them, they expend money, they're not gonna attach themselves to every possible case that the plaintiff's lawyer brings to them. And so the question is cherry picking the cases, okay? And uh, the other thing we find out is that the lawyers, if you look at the Choi Johnson Skinner and Pritchard paper, that the lawyers, how do they get these lead, how do they get these institutional plaintiffs? Well, we ought to be very concerned if these institutions are politically connected because you find the story of Philadelphia law firms contributing to the controller's election in New York City who oversees the New York State Pension Fund, okay? Who can then become a lead plaintiff. So you have the corruption of the system. That's not a great press either. Um, you know, the, the last paper here is, is again looking at what do we know 
about the small cases. That most people studied the big, big cases. What do we know about the small cases? And these are the cases under $2 million. There's a lot of those. You don't have the institutions involved because they're not, uh, they're not big enough companies to be able to attract an institution holding because they can't exit. And uh, the, the problem with that that we found is that these are cases that they are quickly filed, quickly settled, and the settlement amounts are very small, uh, and the approval losses are very, very problematic. Um, what do we not know about the efficacy? We don't know whether we have type one, type two errors. That is, we have a lot of tightening up that's gone on in beginning in 1995 with something called the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act that introduced a lot of different changes here. You know, what we don't know is whether those changes created more problems than the social good they created because they're throwing a lot of cases out there. The dismissal rate as a result of PSLRA went from 17% to 42%, tripled, okay, nearly tripled. And, um, you know, what do you make of that? Well, it's very hard to get at about because you're trying to figure out what the cases are. Well, what about the SEC? I have a few more minutes here. Well, there have been studies both by Choi Pritchard and again by, by Randall and I um, looking at the fact that uh, it is an empirical question whether you want to have just private suits or whether you want to have uh, just government enforcement. The government enforcement uh, has, uh, uh, depending on what time period you look at it, is a somewhat checkered. It's very sensitive to who's going to be the director of enforcement uh, at the SEC. At the same time, you find that uh, the total number of enforcement cases brought by the SEC is dwarfed by about a ratio of nine to one. Uh, by private suits, and that when you have parallel actions, I mean studies uh, by, by the SEC itself, when you have prior, parallel actions, you have the private suit over here and the government enforcement suit over here, because the way the government is hobbled in imposing penalties, that the, it's comparing the recovery for benefit to uh, investors, it's like one horse, one rabbit. The plaintiffs recover much more, much more robust recovery. Um, the thing that got some press the last spring, you may remember, is our Erska Villanconja's paper uh, indicated that the SEC is not a very good accountant. Uh, they, they can't count what their enforcement actions, they double count, they channel stuff, uh, what, all kinds of problems there. Uh, the real issue there, which she doesn't address, is if you're going to have some meaningful metrics about what the SEC, I'm looking at Craig, sorry. If you're going to have some meaningful <laughs> metrics of what the SEC is doing, we need to have a discussion about that. How do you measure the success for public enforcement of the laws? And that's the thing is not trusting. So it's, you know, if I was the SEC, I wouldn't spend a damn dollar collecting that data. I'd rather be out protecting widows, widowers, and orphans, okay? And I think that's, uh, they just don't give it a priority. Uh, I have one minute, okay, okay, okay. Um, so uh, we had all kinds of debates about who should be enforcing the law, whether it should be no, enforce, no private actions, that's Joe Grunfest's paper, or, uh, and also the Bratton Walker paper, or do you think the SEC should be a clearinghouse for trying to give a, a, a go, go ahead and your park? And then um, um, the last set of uh, issues we have in the kind of fraud area is that, okay, if we, we could look at SEC enforcement as an indication of re regulatory failure. That is, if the other systems are working well, we shouldn't have any private actions or any public enforcement, right? That, that, that should be able to take care of it. So there's these various studies about being made about enforcement. A couple of my, 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 my favorite one is, uh, uh, is, is the whole action about, well, to what extent do you find slippage around disclosure issues? So, for example, the, the most recent study here I have at the very top one, the use of derivatives as a way of capturing the value before market re uh, public release of inside information, uh, that's one. How about these 10B51 plans where executives can have multiple plans, uh, and so therefore there's no insider trading if your trading is automatic per plan, but you can then discreetly Start a plan, cancel a plan, it's like that, to, to gain the system, and, and Todd Henderson does a great job of collecting that. Uh, other slippages in the system, the SEC is not very good about enforcing the law, about bundling and proxies, and the uh, Bliss Partner playing indicates that companies, when they finally find that Mary's been cooking the books in the back room and they make an announcement, the first thing the lawyer says, okay, so you're gonna tell you've been inflating the earnings, yep, and, you, and you're caught red-handed, yep. Well, do you have any other bad news released at the same time? Because you want to have these confounding variables that go into the market, which makes it absolutely impossible for the plaintiffs to succeed in their case, because the plaintiff has to show not only that a lie was told, but that they suffered an economic loss when the truth came out. 
So when you release the truth and it's going to make the price go down, you know, say that your CEO committed murder, okay, uh, <laughs> that you've lost your biggest client, all of these unrelated to fraud, just dump it out there. Everything goes to hell in a handbasket, and you can't, uh, you can't change it. And then uh, uh, there are a couple of, of survey articles, none really recent, but that'll be something that, that's out there. Thank you for your indulgence. You've seen seven people writing ideas of what to research after your last statement. Richard. Thanks, Dan. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks for the opportunity to talk. I do just want to begin with two quick apologies. First, um, this has been a topic, uh, a conference primarily um, with accountants discussing fraud, and um, I've got a bunch of slides here, and one by one, I felt like each of my slides has been talked about already in one of the prior uh, sessions. So what I hope to do, I'll, I'll run through them. I may go more quickly through some of them. Um, but I, I, I'll stop on some of them and provide some perspectives that uh, perhaps we haven't discussed. Um, the other apology that I want to give, we have a lot of accountants in here, um, and I'm uh, just in my 10 minutes or however many, much time I've got here, I'm obviously not going to be able to talk about all accounting research, so I've picked a couple of studies that are, I think are interesting um, that I wanted to, to elaborate on, so I don't want to offend anyone whose research I didn't talk about, and if we do do the big review, that'll be a lot more ex extensive. Um, you know, in the breaks, a lot of people have asked me about the history of research on accounting fraud, um, and I thought I'd just give a, a quick perspective on that to the, the younger people. I'm now one of the older people who might be interested. And when I graduated about 25 years ago, there was actually very little research on accounting fraud. I think Zovana was one of the um, pioneers. Um, there was A. Brilloff, who'd done some um, um, very intriguing work. When we look back on it, I think the, that we look back on it today, we'd sort of see it as a sort of genius work, but he was sort of viewed to be on the uh, fringe and not using um, modern scientific method and not understanding uh, modern theories like the efficient market theory when he was doing that research and uncovering some of the big frauds. Um, so when I came along, um, the sort of view in the academic literature, in the accounting academic literature, was that the market pretty much saw through any accounting shenanigans. Investors just saw through it and part of the market efficiency hypothesis. Um, and that if any accounting fraud took place or any accounting manipulation took place, it must be primarily to game a contract, like a debt contract or a, a bonus contract or something of that nature, um, which just didn't seem to sort of jive with me. So I was just there at the right time in the right place. Um, I wrote, for example, many of you know my paper on accruals, and I stole that measure from Paul, who's sitting up there, from his dissertation, which was looking at uh, compensation contracts, and decided to just check whether the market investors seemed to see through accruals. Um, and the main motivation behind the, uh, the original AER paper that I did with Pat and Amy um, was when we found those AERs and started reading through them, we found that the allegations or the statements made in those AERs were basically that investors were being misled. They weren't, you know, this was counter to the efficient market hypothesis. It wasn't so much about bonus contracts or debt contracts, but that investors had been duped by these um, uh, accounting misstatements and manipulations and had, had lost money as a result. And I think when you fast forward 25 years to today, that almost seems that we take that for granted. Um, but, but if you go back to the just 25 years ago, um, there really wasn't much accounting research uh, on, on securities fraud um, to speak of. So with that, Dan asked me to talk a little bit about the definition of accounting fraud, and I think this is an important question that I want to say a little bit about. I think part of Jonathan's point was that researchers tend to just pick a database, and if there's an observation in the database, we call it a financial misstatement or whatever, and we do a research on accounting fraud. And, it's, it's sort of dependent on the database, and we're perhaps not careful enough about defining the type of fraud we're looking for. Um, I just wanted to point out here that a, a lot of the uh, databases um, use class action lawsuits, and most of them, class action lawsuits, are brought under the 10b-5, which, the, fraud, the fraud lawsuits, which is the general prohibition against fraud. Um, a subset of them ones that tend to relate to accounting fraud are normally brought under this uh, Section 13B, 
Um, and one of the things we did in the AR database, it, it, it has a whole bunch of actions in there. Some of them, for example, mention companies, but are primarily against auditors, um, and they're not brought under Section 13B. We tried to isolate all the ones that are brought, brought under Section 13B. And I just wanted to give you some perspective here um, on, 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 on the variety of different things that you get to see. So I took this from Cornerstone Research. Each year they put out, it's on the Stanford website, this class, securities class action year in review. And they go back here, what is it, five years. Um, and they look at, these are from the class action filings. They look at the types of allegations that were made. Uh, and these are percentages, and you can see that on the top there, over 90, nearly 100% of them allege financial misrepresentations. And in fact, a lot of accounting research has taken them and said that they're accounting misstatements. Um, I've, I've certainly seen papers that have done that. But if you drill down a little bit, what you'll see is over half of them are for false forward-looking statements. Now, they certainly could be statements about accounting numbers, you'd have to dig in and take a look at them. I'm going to give you an example of what one of them looks like in a second. But only about a third are actually due to gap violations, um, which you might really think of as pure accounting frauds. Um, and just to give you one example um, of what a financial misrepresentation can look like, I thought this was an interesting example some of you may have seen. This one is about a year old now coming on, relates to Volkswagen ADRs. As it says at the top there, in case you didn't know, um, according to the release, it's a car maker in Europe. <laughs> um, and, it, and I thought this is one that most of you might be familiar about. And they start off by saying the company made false and misleading statements and blah, blah, blah. So it looks like financial misstatement. Then the part that I highlighted there is the uh, specifically defendants misled investors by failing to disclose that the company had utilized a defeat device in certain of its diesel cars. And you can see that's clearly, I don't think, an accounting fraud. Um, and it's, it's, it's primarily a fraud on consumers, right? As, as a, and, and obviously, it's going to have implications for the companies. Um, but this is the type of thing that would be classified as a financial misstatement. And you can read as you go down there, as they're trying to explain why they're doing this class action lawsuit on behalf of the investors, um, they talk about how this led investors to overestimate the profitability because obviously now they got caught, their profit's going to be lower and so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, I, I in fact think this is an important issue that we haven't thought enough about as accounting researchers. Um, and it, I think this is part of what's led to the problem that Jonathan described of um, researchers just picking a database. There's a line item there, there's an observation, you throw it in. And um, so, you know, for example, it wouldn't make much sense to look here to see whether accruals were inflated, with high working capital around this type of a fraud because it's not the essence of the fraud here. Um, one thing I will just say in the, the AER database, one of the reasons we originally put it together um, and what we really focus on in that database, we have two sheets in it where we read through the AERs and identify the specific quarters and years, the fiscal quarters and years that the uh, SEC alleged there was an earnings manipulation. So you, there's various pieces to the database, but that was our attempt to zero in on the, the accounting frauds uh, as opposed to some of these other events. Um, talk quickly about motivations. This is where I'm going to get into stuff that we've already talked a lot about. And let me just give you the highlights here. The, the thing that really comes out loud and clear here through the research is stock-based compensation. And I, I should point out that some of the studies that I've listed there have defined that more generally and to just include stock ownership. You may, you may not have got the stock as part of a formal compensation package, but if you own a lot of stock in the company, um, you're more likely to uh, commit accounting fraud. Now, the one point I want to make here, which we've discussed, I think Jared was making this point and has been made various times throughout the conference, is the cases that have been looked at here clearly did a really, really bad job, right? Because we know that when these frauds were discovered, the stock prices plummeted, just like we saw in Xerox, as Jonathan showed us. And so these are all cases. It's sort of odd that we've come to the conclusion that the reason that they committed these frauds was to increase the value of their stock-based compensation on a sample where they, in fact, pretty much wiped out the value of their stock-based compensation. So I think we, should, we, we could do more research, and I'd like to certainly better understand um, whether this is just the tip of the iceberg, and there's lots and lots of cases where they get away with it. 
or whether this is just sort of dumb behavior, um, irrational behavior. I'm going to talk about a study in a second, the slippery slope study, which perhaps suggests it might just be irrational behavior. And you know, we start off with a small error and then escalating commitment. We feel trapped into it. And this isn't really behavior that w the executives would have intended to do ex ante. But another explanation is there's just a lot of uh, executives who get away with this type of stuff. Um, quick example, I have a hedge fund manager um, who speaks in my class each year, and the students always ask him, he goes, he, he specializes in identifying fraudulent companies, you know, he has a good track record, how often do you get it wrong? And he gives an example, I won't actually mention the company here because it's not my example, and, um, but it's now a major biotechnology company, one of the top, I think certainly one of the top 20 in the world, and um, actually hasn't been around that long, and he said this company was a fraud. They had one product that was basically a fraud, and they had taken a big position against the company. Um, they managed to eke out a couple of extra rounds of financing before they were caught, and then they stumbled over a blockbuster drug. And that blockbuster drug basically allowed to cover up the fraudulent drug that they'd, um, that they'd been engaging in the tomfoolery with. Um, and they ended up becoming a successful company that uh, employs thousands of people today. Um, so that was just one nice example um, of why this just might be the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, and can you see my point? There must be, it, it stands to reason that there's some executives making big gains from doing this, which is a sort of scary thought. Um, on the characteristics of accounting fraud, I'm short on time and I want to allow us to open up for questions. So let me summarize in here and just zero in on a couple. Weak governance structures, I think we've talked about a lot. Um, I'm actually always surprised by how few accounting academics are asked to ever serve on audit committees. Um, often the people we know that we see on audit committees don't even have much financial expertise. Um, they tend to be companies with robust, robust past sales growth uh, where profitability is starting to slow. Perhaps they need to raise additional capital to keep their business model going and they feel that pressure to perform. There's evidence that the executives tend to be overconfident. Um, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more detail in a second. Um, this evidence related to the stuff that Sam talked about, the, uh, the, the executives tend to have these moral uh, uh, infractions in their past. And finally, they tend to be driven by the CEO and not the CFO, and the CFO tends to be forced to comply. So the interest of time here, let me skip the governance stuff. Um, I think we've talked a lot about this one. Let me talk about the one, one paper I don't think we've talked about much, which is one of my favorites, is the, the Schrandon Zekman paper on the slippery slope. And what they did is they looked at 49 of the AERs and they, they digged into them in detail and sort of asked what seemed to motivate the executives. And they found that about a third of them were just outright frauds, where seen from the get-go, for whatever reason, the executives just decided to um, fabricate invoices and so on and so forth. But in the majority of them, they found that the very first evidence that the SEC documented of uh, overstated earnings, um, in their judgment was something that was probably could have been justified. It, we, we could argue whether it was aggressive, but it probably didn't cross the line and probably wasn't clearly um, a violation of GAAP. You know, they didn't make book another big, big enough provision or something of that nature. Um, but then what they happened is they tracked them. Uh, obviously, they made this in the hope that they were going to be able to make up for it in a subsequent quarter or fiscal year. That didn't happen, and so they had to grow the lie to cover up because, you know, as we know, accruals reverse, and so once your original overstatement reverses, you have to uh, try and cover it up. And it's what they call the slippery slope. Um, the sort of headline point of the paper is that um, more over-optimistic in investors sorry, more over-optimistic CEOs, um, executives are more likely to fall down this slippery slope. The one thing that I point out in that paper, if you read it carefully, that I found just was a little bit unsatisfying was the way they modeled overconfident executives was executives with less variable compensation, which seemed like an odd definition to me if you dig into it. Um, the, the reasoning there, and there are other papers to back them up here, is that if you're overconfident, you don't need incentive compensation. 